I'm a citizen of Europe. Sono cittadina europea. Ich bin europäischer Bürger. Biam Europeana. Europa e Polgar Eu sou europeia. Jag är en medborgare i Europa. Jag som europeanka. Yo soy ciudadana del continente europeo. Y estén europeos chiquitos. Es su europeo. Son chetazan a la Europa. Ya gashanka y Europa. Ya romayanka y Europa. Es su europeo. Moi, je suis un citoyen européen. This is European Citizens Radio and we are here with a new speciality. Normally, as we have been saying a lot of times, we are sitting in the Café Aroma in Berlin, Schöneberg. And Café Aroma, we have selected this café because we want to give a new aroma taste to Europe. Because we are definitely thinking that Europe can do better and can have a different spirit and culture and energy than it has actually. So we started this European Citizens Radio and normally Again, we do it in Café Aroma in Berlin in German. But now we do it in English. And this is the second time because last week already I spoke to my old Hungarian friend Laszlo Andor. We talked about social Europe and because I do not speak any Hungarian, we basically decided to do it in English, which is obviously the lingua franca of Europe. And because this was quite a nice recording and because also we do obviously not want to have a European citizens radio only in German, but in many languages, I'm very, very pleased today to sit with my old friend Marie-Hélène Cayol in France, in Paris, in the 16e arrondissement, in her apartment. And the topic we choose today for a talk is that we want to discuss the question of European democracy and the question of European citizenship. Uh, in French, we have called this uh, recording Les Aléas de l'Appétit démocratique de l'Europe contemporaine à l'aune du parcours de Franck Bianchieri. So may I present you Marie-Hélène Cayol. Déjà, elle a mon âge. She has, like me, 58 years. So we are in the European business since quite a while, Marie-Hélène. Mm -hmm. uh, so two or three decades. And Marie-Hélène, she has been married with uh, Franck Bianchieri. And Franck Bianchieri is one of the first inventors may I say, of the notion of European citizenship and of the notion of the need for, demo for the democratization of Europe, because in the 80s already and in the 90s, he came across and said, look, if we are now doing the Maastricht Treaty, if we are now doing uh, the structure of a political union and of a European defense and security policy, we will need the citizens in this. This was his motivation. And Marie-Hélène, she has been doing studies in social science. She is is, uh, she, she speaks many languages, Arabic and Russian, uh, and she started off her European interest with Euromed, so with looking at the relation between Europe and the Mediterranean area. And she will now basically tell us how she met Frank Biancheri in the midst of the 80s or the 90s in Brussels and what by then were the, the, the drive, what were by then the ambition for a democratic Europe. So welcome Marie-Hélène to this podcast in English. Thank you, Ulrike. It's a pleasure being here, well, being you being here. <laughs> I am in Europe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss this democratization of Europe indeed, which uh, is the word that Franck Bianca used to use more than citizenship, in fact, even though, of course, it implied it. But the key word of his uh, whole, whole career was democratization. Uh, the, that was really the angle. And he was very much on the engineering aspect of it, uh, how to connect the citizens uh, to uh, these uh, institutions, these decision-making levels. Uh, uh, so I met him in 91 or two, I, I'm never sure of that. Uh, um, at the time I had nothing to do with Europe, whereas he was already, uh, had been already active in, uh, in this project since the 85. So it's, it had already been six years. He was uh, involved six, seven years that he was heavily involved in that project. We will discuss it further uh, a little later. Uh, but myself, I come, as you mentioned it briefly, I come from human sciences, languages, uh, 
I had studied Arabic, and this is given. This this had given me my first, the first uh, uh, direction to my career, which was more about the Arab world. Uh, and I came to Europe how, uh, somehow from the Mediterranean uh, because I was uh, I met Frank, and um, uh, and uh, I had the opportunity to work on his organization of the time, which was called Prometheus Europe. Uh, which I, uh, uh, he asked me to, uh, to help him uh, build the NICOMED uh, project of, of the Prometheus uh, Europe Association, NICOMED, Network of Information Between the Community, the European Community, and the Mediterranean. Uh, so we, during uh, at least uh, seven, eight years, I've been uh, very uh, involved in uh, active in organizing events uh, which were aimed with, uh, at uh, bringing citizens, uh, of, uh, beneficiaries of, those, of the programs of decentralized cooperation that had been launched in the 90s by the European Commission, in particular towards the, the Mediterranean, uh, these Euromed pro programs. Uh, and the whole idea of the association that Franck was running at the time, Prometheus Europe, was to use these programs, which were indeed tools to reach out to the citizens uh, uh, and to improve, in fact, uh, the capacity to, uh, to, to embark the citizens, to take their uh, interests into account, etc. So, so the idea was to focus on these programs. Uh, and as, NG as an NGO, as an outsider uh, uh, organization, uh, to uh, um, invite uh, beneficiaries, uh, that, that is the word that was used, beneficiaries of these programs into events in order to take it, their uh, needs better into account and inform the, the send the, the information about these um, interest needs, etc., towards the Commission so that but, uh, the European Commission would improve the, chisel out uh, the, 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 those programs uh, uh, with a view to uh, improve the connection between the two. Okay, so uh, what we are going to do here is basically uh, take an angle of today. Today, today we are speaking on the 19th of May 2023 and uh, look at what European democracy and European citizenship may mean today to young Europeans or to Europeans in general, because Europe has been going through crises, many crises. There has been the pandemic, which has scattered a little bit the societal fabrics. Uh, there's a social crisis in many EU countries. There's populism. Uh, the, the, the European notion is sort of gone away. Yeah? So the, the aim of this podcast is that we want to look at what is the notion, I mean, what is the, the, the how there is a resonance of European democracy and European citizenship in the air with respect to what it was in former times. So I have invited Marie-Hélène uh, because she was in the bath of the euro making in the <laughs> early days. We need to imagine that in the 80s and the 90s, um, uh, and I already said it just for the listeners, we are having having the same conversation in French about mm. citizenship, la citoyenneté européenne. So we did this conversation already in French, um, and uh, but we do it in English now to have more listeners. But um, what we want to point to is that the mood in the 80s and in the 90s were just quite different from what it is is today because in the 80s as people may or some may remember the older the elder may remember we had the european single act we had the beethoven's ninth symphony which was uh, becoming the european anthem uh, we had the bordeaux red passport sort of thing uh, and we were called to be european citizens and the artists were invited to think about european identity and all these things and in this mood marie hélène cayol avec uh, with her husband you were placing your activities and perhaps you can tell us a little bit how did you get started about connecting the European students to the project mm -hmm. of political union? So in fact I was not part of that history because I met him after. I met him when he was in charge of Prometheus Europe as I said but becomes from well, his big feat was to have launched to, uh, in, in 1985 uh, from uh, Sciences Po, where he was a student. Uh, he launched the Association des États Généraux des Étudiants d'Europe uh, 
Asia Europe, which is a huge organization, a student organization still existing today, uh, which started then, uh, um, and which um, uh, after was was extremely successful very fast. Huh? So they they, they launched the first uh, first congress in 1985, followed by another one that started reaching out to to other European universities. So it was the idea that the students built here, of the students voilà. get engaged the students into connect together. It was more of a well, it was it was fun at the beginning. I think. <laughs> bon, I think bon, fun is call, always good. You don't call something <laughs> état généraux, referring to uh, voilà, the expressions that come back, come from the revolution without a political intention but I think it was not so political it was mostly the idea to connect to well, discuss to open up to this uh, to these other cultures that all of a sudden the frontiers also uh, there was this uh, the borders uh, uh, were collapsing so there was this feeling of the what well, being deconfined <laughs> uh, and uh, and this enthusiasm to reach out to other uh, to other students from different culture from other cultures uh, so that was mostly what was at the uh, um, intention at the beginning but two years later, because of their nature, they were what well, I caught their attention was caught by the fact that there was a program that was uh, being prepared of, a, of student exchange. Which is the program which is that going to be the program, the Erasmus program, mm -hmm. which has been asked by political leaders of the time, which is being prepared by the European Commission, but which is being buried, <laughs> dug under the carpet by the national administrations, uh, who uh, what I find it uh, uh, more bothering than anything than anything else, or so not necessarily very keen on mixing their, as we say in French, tête blonde. So in fact, discreetly, the administrations are burying the project, and it takes the energy of the students uh, to actually re understand, realize first, try to understand where the problem comes from. Uh, tried to understand, uh, to inquire, investigate uh, how, how to solve that blockade, and uh, end up at the Elysee Palace in 1987. Franck Bianchery and his advisors are on one side of the table for a lunch, and Franck Bianchery and his team of Europeans on the other side of the table to, to uh, catch the attention to, to of Mr. Of President. Mr. President, who thinks he's in a very, uh, voila, uh, con, convenu uh, uh, meeting uh, to, with European students uh, that he likes and that he likes Europe. Uh, and in fact, uh, well, it takes a lot of um, uh, energy and even a bit of impoliteness to actually, at some point, uh, tell Mr. Mr. Mitterrand, you don't understand what we're telling you. The program is not, the Erasmus program is not going to happen. It's being dug, uh, it's being buried, and we need you to uh, unbury it. And so, um, and there is this very interesting conversation there that starts at the Elysee between Franck Bianchery and, and, and François Mitterrand, at the end of which uh, François Mitterrand declares in front of the, of the press uh, that he has uh, been uh, voilà, in a meeting with the young students and that he's learned that there were uh, is, well, that it was uh, there were issues uh, preventing the program from being launched and that it was not possible because it was key for the future of Europe that this program so let's and just I'd like to finish because I think that's where the vocation the actual political vocation of Franck Bianchery uh, and this uh, program of democratization of Europe comes because comes from because that's when Franck Bianchery realized that without European citizens uh, uh, Europe was going nowhere. So let's uh, just uh, 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 nail this down. Um, the Erasmus program, if you listeners, young Europeans uh, across the European continent today, you are part of a European Erasmus program. This is because of Franck Bianchery. This is because of Marie-Hélène. This program didn't fall from the skies. So at some point in history, in 85, there were young students who wanted to discover Europe, who wanted to take the notion of European democracy and European citizenship for serious. They wanted to engage. They wanted to know each other and to get each other's culture. And that is why you are now benefiting from a European Erasmus program. So if you, you want to further shape European democracy and further shape European citizenship, uh, let's remind that Europe is in your hands and that at each and any time in history, you can go back to these ideas. By the way, Marie-Hélène, I know that Franck um, uh, died in 2012. Uh, since ever then, you have been very busy to um, get his archives ready and you uh, could place them in, uh, I think, in Geneva. May you just, for those 
those who are interested now in the Vita and in the CV of Franck Bianchieri, tell us a little bit where people can look up in the internet to get a little bit known uh, of his work. Yes, so you're right to, to remind that, so that uh, the Fondation uh, Jean Monnet for Europe, based in Lausanne in Switzerland, uh, is now has asked us to, to uh, conserve uh, the, the archives of Franck Bianchieri. So, uh, if you go to their website, Fondation FGME, Fondation Jean Monnet for Europe, uh, there is one uh, section on Franck Bianchieri. Uh, so, that's the first uh, place where everything is. I don't they digitalize part of it, otherwise, you have to go uh, on site. Uh, it's accessible for students, I guess, uh, etc. But there is also what we launched after, right after he passed away in 2012. Uh, we launched the Association des Amis de Franck Bianchieri, the Association of his, of his Friends, uh, where, and there is a website where there is also uh, quite a lot of uh, information available. The website is franck Tredunion bianchieri.eu, uh, something like that. But, uh, voilà. And there's a Wikipedia page also that, uh, that tells a bit, a bit about uh, okay. his history. So thank you for this information because I think it's very important for young people who today think about the sort of the future of this continent. I mean, Marie-Hélène, we, we convened that today we basically start discussing the moment of crisis we are in because we are talking in May 23. We have been experiencing the pandemic. We have been experiencing the war on Ukraine, which in a way is, uh, say, unusual word for Europe because Europe told for 70 years Europe is no longer war, no more war in Europe. This was the big narration of a peaceful Europe and integration and that we integrate countries so that they can no longer do war. But now, although European countries are not formally in war and not engaged, we are sending we are sending armaments, I mean, we are helping. There's a whole discourse about basically warfare in Europe, which is at least unusual for the Europe we know. The second thing is that Europe was uh, uh, basically going beyond nationalism, going beyond uh, nation, nation states. We had uh, huge discussions in the 1990s to overcome nation state, to go for European integration, to um, uh, basically unite the European citizens and uh, Marie, Hélène and, and, and myself, we feel like these discussions have been fading away. Yeah? And so we want to go from today, from the assessment that the, that the hunger, the hunger for European democracy, the sheer idea that we no longer discussing these things in these terms, there's not much talk about European citizenship and what could it be, there's not much talk about European democracy and what could it be that we from this assessment today we go back to the 80s to the 90s uh, and then the the first decades in the in this century um, to analyze when were the ruptures what would you say marie hélène when the appetite for european citizenship when did it decline or when it was shaken well first of all i'd like to come back on this present situation that you describe uh, what are like, very similarly to what i would uh, so we have a, an existential question weighing on on, on on Europe. Uh, it's still called the European Union, but uh, I don't see the base, basic principles indeed of peace, democracy and, uh, and prosperity being uh, being at the still still at the core of uh, of the project, and this is why people are frustrated. This is why the populists are having all these resentments, exactly. and this is why Marine Le Pen and FPE and AfD and, and exactly. all of, uh, voilà. exactly. But so 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 we have this a certain version of the Europe, of, of Europe that is uh, that seems. You wrote a book, uh, and Spiel, I think, on uh, Europa mm -hmm. or and Spiel Europa, which I share very much. And the question that I ask myself <laughs> uh, 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 um, um, is these days is, uh, do we have, are the conditions ripe for uh, a new surge of um, citizenship, of active citizenship, a European citizenship, or is it the country, are uh, citizens nowhere to be seen, uh, uh, even nation, uh, nation states, uh, which were supposed to represent us uh, at the European Union, are divided now and, uh, and uh, so very weak. And do we have just a superstructure, at, uh, in techno structure, a techno structure uh, which, uh, which runs the show uh, away from media, uh, media uh, uh, citizens concern, away mentioned. from uh, citizen understanding and, uh, and with just anger, uh, grass root anger being uh, fed like that with no Tar not targeting the real decision makers and with no institutional ambitions them. with no institutional ambitions i mean may i just say that uh, uh, we are talking in may 23 but uh, in july 23 so in two months we will see the 20th anniversary 
of the project for a European constitution. We mm. did it precisely, Giscard d'Estaing, by the mm. time uh, in July 23, uh, 23 mm. so uh, 2003, uh, European were on a pro constitutional project. And today, and uh, carried by the citizens, by the way, yeah, because a constitutional project is carried by the citizens. And uh, there's no more discussion mm. even on mm. there should be a constitutional project. Mm -hmm. Voilà, we have a, a Europe I, uh, which, which is making decisions in a very uh, uh, op uh, empty <laughs> political space, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, emptied uh, political space. And do that, voilà, does that create the conditions for a return, in fact, of citizenship uh, uh, of European citizens? Alors, a return, of course, there. European citizenship hasn't really existed yet. Uh, there's been attempts, there's been moments, that's what we're here to discuss. And, and based on voilà, this question about today, do we have... Uh, more, my, 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 my personal feeling is that currently uh, European citizenship is nowhere to be seen. Uh, um, uh, but uh, there, it could also be... Voilà, the, it could also be the conditions could bring very soon some... Voilà, some uh, uh, greater awareness. Why? Because uh, uh, there's something that I like to say is that uh, in the in the past there's been this discussion. Politi the political discussion on Europe was mostly about whether you were for or against Europe, as if we had a choice. So it was a flawed debate, by the way, before anyway. Today, uh, and it's mostly Brexit, I would say, which has brought this uh, this certainty. Uh, it's so difficult to get out. Now we've seen how difficult it is to get out of Europe, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so and and that it's not necessarily what we want. Also, even the far rights, which used to be anti-European, are no longer anti-European. They're not even anti-Euro. Marine Le Pen, for instance, yeah. now. <laughs> May I interrupt you? But this is the the UK could leave because they left only in you know only the, the EU, but the they were Euro. not in the currency, exactly. but. The Greek, we could not, uh, like exactly. the Germans might have wished, thrown them out of the euro because we realized that if you have scrambled X, you mm. know, like a European currency, you can't go back to X. So mm. uh, <laughs> there, there was no choice of, of keeping the Greek in, although many wished by the banking crisis time that the Greeks would be thrown out. So uh, what you are saying is we are in here together. Yes. And the question is not be, be in favor or be exactly. against. That's no longer as what we do, what do we do out of it? And, uh, and so maybe there is even if it's still marginal, there is a strata of citizens who are now becoming aware that decisions are being made at the European level and it's useless to, to moan and, uh, and fight against our national level because that's the one that tries, uh, that is the only one that tries to represent us a little bit. Not very well, not very easily, but uh, voila, they're on our side somehow. Uh, and if we, our anger breaks that, <laughs> what's going to be left to actually represent us at, uh, and I'm not, voila, I have a lot to say about the European Parliament and the European election, which we think are not functional in order to represent European citizens. So that's where we are today. We are uh, with maybe uh, a, a nucleus of, of people throughout Europe who start teaming up because they know now that uh, Europe, we are in it, it's making decisions and well, uh, you need it's to not by getting away from it so that we are going to go uh, any better. So is that, a con is that a circumstance that is prone to, um, to seeing a real citizenship this time emerge, one that comes from the citizens and not indeed uh, uh, from the institutions, the attempts of the institutions. But there is a history of, uh, of this uh, uh, hunger appetite for, for a political Europe, a democratic Europe, uh, that has been going up and down, which we have been able to, to assess, to follow a little bit, but through, by, by the fact that we were fighting for this uh, democratization. And so the question is whether in times of, say, war, in times of uh, where we feel, I think everybody in Europe is feeling that there are geostrategic questions shifting, uh, that there is an American impact on Europe, a Chinese impact, there's this Russian war against Russia, you know, so that the emergence of something like Europe, that the emancipation, you know, this is, uh, by the way, a wording that Emmanuel Macron uses quite often, European sovereignty, European emancipation, but that this emancipation and sovereignty of Europe uh, at the end of the day must have something to do with citizens because there's no such thing than a political project which is not carried by people, by citizens who want that political project. So uh, 
uh, what do you make, Marie Hélène, in this context? I mean, do, do you said there's perhaps a nucleus, you know, of this emergence of rethinking the democratization of Europe. So we are in a time where we see we are, by the way, the forthcoming European elections in exactly one year, 24, we will have uh, European elections. We see little parties emerging like Volt, which is a liberal party acting on the European level. We see another party like Diem, which is a more lefty progressive party uh, led by Yanis Varoufakis, the famous Greek finance minister who had his moment of fame in the banking crisis. Um, but uh, going back in history, uh, give us your experience. Tell us more about Frank Bioncheri's first projects of a European party so that we can see basically the timeline and that today's European parties uh, also are anchored in history and are anchored in people who were motivated creating European parties already 10, 20, 30 years ago. Yes, that's the big characteristic of Frank, eh? apart from having... Uh of being called one of the fathers of uh, the Erasmus pro program, he has created the two first historical trans-European trans -European political parties. Uh, it's worth uh, uh, pronouncing it properly. So first of all, in 1989, uh, after this uh, Asia experiment, uh, uh, they decided to uh, make an attempt of a trans-European political party, which they called Initiative pour une démocratie européenne. How visionary. Uh, at the time, uh, at the time, uh, everybody was, well, not everybody was pro-European, but there was, we were describing this rather pro-European, pro-political uh, Europe uh, uh, feeling, uh, uh, spirit of the, of the 80s, but the people were still very far from uh, imagining uh, uh, what European citizenship uh, could mean. Uh, and so he launched uh, as a student with uh, his, uh, his uh, student uh, friends uh, this first experiment. Uh, which uh, results in uh, well, uh, very few, but it's the first time in history that the same program is presented in three <laughs> at the time. It's a small Europe. I think it's 12, uh, 12 members at the time. So three uh, is quite meaningful already, uh, but, and it's an experiment. So he does it again in, 19, in 2009, uh, but in very uh, difficult con circumstances. First of all, because uh, <clears throat> in, 2000, in 2009, country to 1989 we've lost two decades uh, mm -hmm. in building and trying to uh, in building uh, uh, go deeper into the decades so yes, it's so the, the, the constitutional so, yeah. moment there's the french no there's the banking crisis yeah. when did we lose this yeah, uh, but there's, no there's also there's also in 1989 the fall of the berlin wall the end of the the, the collapse of the of the soviet uh, system uh, and the enlargement the enlargement in which uh, Europe and, uh, well, uh, embarks itself and therefore at the expense of uh, the deepening <laughs> uh, and, uh, and enlargement. So for you, deep. the 89 moment, this sort of unification of Europe is the first moment where the ambition, like we call it, the appetite for European democratic Europe is falling apart voilà. or dismantling. Voilà, voilà. We go back, voilà, the, in the 80s, there's this idea to, ch to turn an economic project into a political project. And in 1989, there is this notion that no, uh, we, voilà, the political uh, project is not uh, right, it's not the moment. Yes. First of all, because we have a huge influence at that time of the Anglo-Saxons, therefore the Americans and the, and the British on the whole project, uh, who do, don't want, of course, the political Europe. So that's the first thing. So they only want the single market, they only want the Euro monetarization, neoliberal Europe. I don't think they want the Euro, certainly not. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they want a, market, a single market. Uh, and the Euro is what Mitterrand and Kohl agree on in exchange of the, by the way, of the, of, uh, of the enlargement. Uh, enlargement, OK. But probably they are aware that it's going to weaken, to dilute, to dilute uh, mm -hmm. indeed, this reflection on the political Europe. Oh, and they, they ask for this euro as, of course, uh, one common sovereign uh, put at the center of the European table that compels Europeans to team up and, uh, voilà, and, and, and organize and themselves. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's, well, the euro is very prone to political Europe. I also remember that in the 90s we had uh, two big discussions. The one was deepening and widening belong yeah. together. Yeah. We always were saying, so we enlarge the European Union, there's the Eastern European countries yeah. coming, but any widening will follow a deepening, you know, so there was this mantra that we had. And I guess the mantra in a way was wrong because the widening happening hap was happening then uh, without the constitution, without the deepening. So we had widening without deepening at the end. 
end. And the second, as you mentioned, is that the euro, the, the monetary project as a sovereign project, which is if you share your money, you need to have political decisions together because yeah. you are basically sharing the budget. Yeah, tied yourself. So that it was a, beyond a, a question uh, about sovereignty. And then here, come in the notion of the of citizenship because you cannot manage a euro or a currency because the money is related to citizens. Citizens are uh, paying with this money. Uh, you Everybody's have, got yeah. Europe in their pocket. Uh, everybody what? has Europe in the wallet. Uh, there is the question of social Europe. There is the question of uh, how we act together, being tied together in a budgetary frame, in a monetary frame, mm. and uh, develop this because uh, in a way I would argue, and I am challenging you on this, uh, the, 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 the euro happened and it's sort of good to have this international currency, uh, which is a heavyweight currency. So I think that's in itself, there's something good in it. But uh, the euro did not perform as that money currency of the citizens, social Europe, because we end up in a banking crisis. And we see again that the European citizens are in a way alienated with their currency. We see the use of Europe uh, standing in the streets, uh, demonstrating uh, against ECB and so on and so forth. So perhaps what was that as a moment for European citizens? Yes, it, but the, the, the euro crisis, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the Greek crisis and bodies, uh, um, is nevertheless the moment when we see a return of uh, this longing, this appetite for, 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 for European citizenship and democracy somehow. Uh, that's when, even if it's unclear, even if it's not, it's not clear in people's mind, but if you look at it voilà, from a broad angle, uh, it's interesting to notice that a euro crisis is the moment when you have, right after the first serious, I would say, this time large scale uh, experiment of trans-European political parties and, uh, of, um, the, conducted by uh, Yanis Varoufakis, who is a key, key uh, player of the, of the Greek crisis and the Euro crisis as a finance minister, fin economic minister of, of Greece on the Tsipras. So he knows exactly what he's talking about. It's, he, know, he is uh, very aware of, uh, of how much we are tied to the Euro. And uh, voilà, when you're in the Euro, uh, you don't get out of it. Uh, and you have to, and so it's not by chance that the first uh, uh, big, I would say this time, uh, trans European political party emerges from the euro crisis. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, yeah, yeah. We, we, I mean, I, I, I'm a political scientist. For those who don't know me, I forgot also to present myself, but I'm Ulrike Gero. Uh, I'm the inventor of European Citizens Radio, which is the podcast format of the European Democracy Lab, which you can also Google, which is little association who wants to reanimate the question on European citizens. And I worked for Jacques Delors. So I have been following in the, in the 90s when Jacques Delors, the famous French uh, uh, man, was president of the European Commission between 85 and uh, 95. And uh, we were doing Les Grands Projets Européens. So we were in that time building this new Europe with the euro currency, with the enlargement, with the constitution. But apparently now we are 10 years later, these big projects sort of failed to grasp the attentions of European citizens. And we see Europe in a moment that was what you were describing, Marie-Hélène, uh, where um, we see Stéphane Essel, indignez vous uh, that many Europeans as a civil society realize, like uh, I I think it was uh, the French uh, uh, Thomas Piketty who said that we created a monster, mm -hmm. that with the EU techno structure we created a monster <laughs> which is not in, resonate, in resonance with any democratic features where the people have no say, where they are overruled by policies like austerity and they needed to cut down their retirement funds and, and whatever. And there was no broad possibility to have a European discussions among the French and the Greek and the Italians and so on and so forth. But we played it national and we basically created populism because the northern countries were saying we don't spend money for the south and the southern countries were saying we do not want to see our retirement uh, uh, cut and so on and so forth. So in that moment where the state system failed, um, in political science you say the European civil society is born and it's born because we create the citizens as an agent and the citizens realize perhaps for the first time in the history of European Union that they need to act, that they need to come together and that they as European citizens have to claim a representation, a common representation as European citizens and they need to become the agents of Europe.
Yes, but um, I wouldn't be so positive <laughs> okay. as you are. I think it's still a very, very small group of citizens who have this I awareness. Uh, the media still are not taking uh, the citizens in the right directions themselves, even though this Europe is discussed a lot in the media, but in a very technocratic manner and not so uh, well. It's always so about the know, council, as a result, right? I don't have the feeling when I look around me, uh, uh, among my friends, among my students, I don't see an, uh, a European awareness. I don't see European interest whatsoever. It's only and the I, pictures of the council. You see, European voilà. council has met and has decided. The council has something. Who's the council? Yeah. Where are the citizens in the council decisions? Yeah. No, no. So, so, uh, so they don't understand. They don't see at all how they can influence that. So they withdraw from it and they act in different ways by acting locally, by uh, acting on a global scale, because the global scale is somehow. <laughs> seems uh, currently easier to reach through internet than the European Commission uh, through what <laughs> we don't know uh, and um, so I see the big 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 majority of, uh, of, uh, of people that I see are not very connected to the rest of Europe uh, are not very interested in the rest of Europe and are completely powerless and uninformed of uh, how you influence the big monster that you were referring to. So currently, I, I don't see a, well, and that, but nevertheless, we see that the seeds are there this time, serious ones, uh, with these parties that you mentioned. Uh, and what well, can these seeds uh, grow? Uh, and the, the bet here is to say if indeed for uh, since the Ukrainian war, we see that uh, where we were somehow represented at the European level through our um, national states, but that the national states are themselves now more and more marginalized into the European uh, um, decision-making system because they are divided. Uh, at some point, do, could there be something like an alliance between national states and citizens uh, to uh, voilà, reclaim the the, uh, well, uh, the the European level. So what do you do about, uh, first, two questions. So uh, first, uh, uh, what you say, uh, projected to the European uh, Parliament elections next year. I mean, is there any forecast that we can say that we will have good results or we'll be able to mobilize European citizenship mm -hmm. questions and replace the question of European democracy in the middle of the table and not go, as I would call it, only functional policies? Because mm -hmm. the EU is rather good in shaping functional policies and it does a next generation euro budget here and it does a green deal there and it does asylum policies here but the institutional uh, fix how to fix european democracy is not set that much a, a, a debate on the other hand i guess you have also observed this um, table ronde so the conference on the future of europe where the european commission engaged a huge moderation interviewing european citizens 300,000 european citizens organized several um uh, uh, civil society meetings and citizens assemblies, I think in Lisbon and in uh, in in in, in uh, uh, Dublin and in Venice. I mean, there were several citizens assemblies. People can look them up in the internet, and it was meant to ask European citizens sort of what do you wish for, and uh, so there were questions, there were results, uh, and these results were presented last year, 9th of May, European Day last year. 49. Uh, recommendations of European citizens for a better Europe. So isn't there something like a citoyenneté européenne, a sort of ambition to go for European citizenship and democracy question again? Do you see this? I think these uh, initiatives are useful. Uh, they it's easy to say well, it served uh, well, it was purposeless uh, it, well, we don't see any result uh, because well, because who is there to actually observe the impact of something like that? probably no one, so it's easy to be very um, disdainful with regards to this kind of initiative. And you're right that de facto it, it, is, it operates things, it does uh, change something and probably it contributes to adding people to this idea that uh, look ahead, uh, look upon your head, stop uh, moaning about your governments and, uh, and voilà, look at where decision, uh, key decision are made at this European level and uh, and see well voilà, and organize yourselves. So yes, you're right that there are there are multi-directional initiatives, uh, whether it's uh, purely uh, 
uh, uh, citizen initiatives such as this, the trans-European political parties that we've been discussing, GM25 and Volt in a different mood, huh? uh, different uh, spirit. Uh, but voilà, that's what politics need, huh? different spirits to team up. Uh, and also institutional also initiatives. Uh, I think uh, Fr France, again, was very much behind this, uh, this uh, project. Uh, discussing the future also is very interesting. I'm, I'm myself a futurist. Huh? My uh, specialty now is... Uh, political anticipation and uh, I am absolutely convinced that indeed it's by bringing the students, citizens into looking ahead what Europe do we want tomorrow uh, to which is uh, voilà, to, to actually voilà, to, to create a, a momentum a direction a movement uh, uh, that will uh, embark more and more people but voilà, there are still lots of elements which are missing and one of them is definitely what we were discussing the fact that uh, we have been our borders uh, have risen again uh, a little bit I think we are further away the ones from the others uh, in Europe the Erasmus project uh, that we were discussing is no longer serving the mixing of of, of young citizens of young uh, of young uh, Europeans anymore. Of uh, very uh, hardly, uh, it's uh, the Euro the Erasmus because project uh, na, uh, because the Erasmus uh, has has turned into Erasmus Mundus, <laughs> and now uh, from what I can uh, see uh, among my students and uh, and around, uh, most Erasmus most Erasmus students don't go to Europe; they go outside Europe. They go to uh, Australia, Philippines, uh, uh, the US, etc. Which et is not bad, which, but which is not the vocation. But which the... is not the vocation of, of uh, voilà, there can be international projects of, of student exchange, but Erasmus uh, was the, designed was to designed basically to, produce uh, yeah, European to, to, to mix, uh, mix students, to, to uh, enable students to study uh, uh, in Europe, to learn a European language, to, uh, voilà, to get to know Europe. Uh, and and, and this the other culture and that yeah. so much uh, mm -hmm. uh, anymore and so uh, uh, even so we are diluting the interest of European young Europeans mm -hmm. to meet mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to be able to create a common democracy yeah. because you need to learn the culture the identity of somebody else if you want to be in a de democratic sort of unity with him and uh, so you are basically arguing that this central vocation of Erasmus is no longer met the moment we turned Erasmus into Erasmus Mundus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So we have both, uh, and th that's a serious uh, issue, huh? because there is little to do to actually to, to re resurrect uh, the, the spirit of, of Erasmus. Uh, if we don't, uh, it will mean that we, we, we can count on this European citizenship to emerge. Uh, we have to count on the Erasmus generation, which therefore is maybe just one generation. <laughs> the one a little younger than ours. Yeah. Uh, 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 and maybe we should focus our energy on this group of people. Maybe they are the ones that we find in those political parties. Well, even I know there are lots of young people as well, so maybe they are capable of embarking the next generation, but it's not Erasmus anymore, which so, is embarking the, 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 the young generation into uh, becoming European citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there is no more ambition. I remember there is a book of Jean-Marc Ferry uh, of the year 2000, three years before the European Constitutional Project, which is called l'État, uh, la question de l'État européen, the question of the European state. If we talk about European citizenship, basically citizens need a state, a state needs citizens. There is the, the question of the European state was in the discussion some 20 years ago when we were driving for a constitution and having big projects of constitutionalization of Europe. So you are arguing that this is largely diluted, that this aim and this appetite for uh, citizenship, democracy, institutional building is fading away and that the youngsters, the young students today are taking Erasmus to see uh, another country for half a year, but uh, it's no longer sort of this, um, yeah, this appetite to build something together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, and the Europe, European Union seems a bit, uh, I, th I don't know, it seems a bit uh, boring, dull, outdated. There seems so, so much, if you're interested, if you are an, uh, somehow a, a citizen, you tend to be, and you're 20 years, 25 years old today, you tend to be a global citizen. It's easier, as I was saying, uh, by the internet takes you to this global level. Uh, and it is important, I think, for Europe to position itself as a lift to the global level. <laughs> and I think it's but that Europe it, itself it has a role. It's interesting that, uh, that the national states become 
what they were at the origin, but they've been afraid of, of the next steps because they were afraid of losing their own uh, power. Uh, but taking, embarking their citizens to the next level, which is the European level, and the European level should already project for, because that's the only way to be interesting for the young generation. Europe is not interesting as an end, it's interesting as a means. As a means, as a means, as a means, means to shape the world. Means mm -hmm. To go, to reach out to the actual mm -hmm. level where we, where we must still build something, which is this level of global governance. How do we deal with all the issues that we, which we have today, which are de facto global? And what the, the bargaining power of, 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 of Europe is that one. That's where it is interesting. That's where it could embark. It could embark so it is the young generation and saying, OK, you know, buy me, <laughs> come to me, uh, get it. But, uh, and together, we will reach out to the world, to the environmental uh, uh, topic, to uh, all these global topics, to uh, the question of the uh, new tech, uh, uh, individual uh, uh, voilà, climate, climate change, etc. And that's uh, and that's what it is trying to do in, in a way, but uh, but it's not so much describing how, I mean, how the European Union can help us influence the global level and the global issues. So we are coming to an end of this podcast, but what I think you were trying to, to grasp or to describe in the past uh, one or two minutes is the question of European identity. I mean, is there a sort of political ambition that we as Europeans are trying to shape the world or sort of do we go straight to the world? I mean, is I, there is there a European I entity that, uh, I, I don't, intermediate? Myself, I'm not very interested in the notion of identity. I don't like it so much. I, I'm not sure you do either. Um, no. uh, voilà. uh, so I don't think we need a European identity because this is typically one that shuts us into our... our yeah. in, we don't want to shut ourselves And people are against Europeans. because people want exactly. uh, no European identity. There's a national identity. Mm. I'm from a certain town. I'm from Barcelona. I'm from Hamburg. I'm from London. But there's no... Voilà. I, I, voilà. I agree with you. But we want uh, basically state power or acting power mm. or uh, uh, capaci we capacity to... Political capacity. Cap to political influence, capacity. To, yeah. to, to, for, voilà, to, to, to get what uh, the kind of society we want. And this society is globalized. That's a fact. Huh? Internet, uh, globalization, even if it's broken a little bit and it's breaking apart, uh, it's not breaking apart really. I mean, globalization, glo the, the world is now hard. Everybody, every student's horizon is the world. So let's end on the one thing that uh, if you had something to say and you wanted to promote European democracy building again and the notion of European citizenship, what would you do as the one thing that could as get us back to this question, which is, I think, preeminent and today more than perhaps in the past? Well, embark into uh, those uh, trans-European political parties, think that 2024 is uh, going to be an important date. Uh, it's interesting to to notice not only the fact uh, the fact all the Europe all the elections that will happen in 2024. In 2024, we have the European election, we have the American election, we have uh, the Indian elections, we have huge countries' elections uh, in the same year. So it could be uh, voilà, un déferlement d'élections. Yeah, we, we have. Uh, uh, um, a tsunami of, uh, of change ahead, uh, possibly, uh, and um, also the Americans have, uh, the Biden is talking about uh, l'Alliance des Démocraties, I don't remember the name, uh, democracy, uh, democratic states gathering, blah, blah. The Chinese are working on, democ on uh, reinventing democracy in the 21st century. And I think it's a bit of very, very sad that today we have so little that is projected by the Europeans, by Europe, by the European institutions, by uh, voilà, Europe as a whole, in terms of uh, voilà, we are the inventors uh, of democracy. Uh, so uh, it's high time. And in 2024, if we could also start projecting to the face of the world that we also are thinking uh, about the future of democracy, knowing that we have the fertile grounds for that, because we have this transnational, this supranational dimension, which enables us quite easily to make experiments, uh, innovative experiments in the field of democracy. It's easier for us uh, to do so. Talking also about the Euroland, now uh, those uh, there could be experiments uh, conducted on this on the basis of just the countries of the Euro of the Eurozone, which don't have their democratic institutions, which are missing. So we have this 
semi-democratic, uh, big uh, EU uh, voilà, uh, mechanism, but on the Eurozone, we don't have anything. Uh, uh, and so that's one, that was one of the projects of Franck Biancheri, was to try to, uh, was to say that Euroland must, must, could be uh, treated as voilà, the, uh, the, the grounds for, for uh, political for union. Yeah, I, I, I would take and so we have a, a space for invention, which the Americans and the Chinese don't have. The Americans uh, don't have... I, the, the, voilà. I will need to shut you down, yeah. but I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sensing that we need to do this in a second sort of series, and then we will come back to Euroland and the democratization yeah, structures. But for our listeners, what we keep back now is that Marie-Hélène's proposal for getting back to the core question of Europe, which is the, 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 the question of European citizenship and how to make it work and how to make European democracy work, is to focus on next year's European elections. There's one year time to mobilize, to put the right questions on the table, to ask ourselves where do we come from, how did we go through the two wars on the continent, war against the virus, war on, in, in, in Ukraine, and how how to see the emergence, perhaps, of the question of European democracy and the emergence of question of European sovereignty and European citizenship. For now, uh, perhaps we can come back and do a second sort of uh, recording here. But for now, Marie-Hélène, I'm very, very thankful for having been with me and discussing these uh, sparkling questions. And mm -hmm. uh, I hope that you listeners, you enjoyed this. You enjoyed to uh, hear a little bit more that the question of European democracy is the oldest, but also the youngest question uh, in the timeline still not solved, is still on the agenda and that there's work to do. I hope we mobilize you all to work with us on this question. I hope I found some new friends for the European Citizens Radio because I invented this format precisely for that, that we have one year time before the European elections mm -hmm. to think about this question. Well done. Thank well you, marie the intention. Thank you, Ulrike, and congratulations for everything you do. <laughs> Bye. I'm a citizen of Europe. Sono cittadina europea. Ich bin europäischer Bürger. Iam europeana. Europa i polgar vojo. Eu sou europeia. Jag är en medborgare i Europa. Ja som europeanka. Eu sou cidadana do continente europeu. Jestem europejczykiem. Eu moi, je suis un citoyen européen.